Yeah. <laughs> All right. We've got our technical uh, issues solved. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. And Sword and Laser is a book club, but we are so much more. We bring you author interviews, news from the world of science fiction and fantasy, and, of course, fantastic discussions from fans like you. Our show is actually funded by you as well. Uh, our patrons at Patreon dot com slash sword and laser thanks to all the folks who back our show if you would like to support the show in that manner head to patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash sword and laser and of course we are very excited to welcome back onto the show mike cole mike thank you so much for joining us again thanks so much for having me and so, Mike, you have been, uh, we've been keeping up to date with you uh, online for the past couple of months, and, and now you're coming out with a brand new novel, um, Gemini Cell, which is a Shadow Ops novel, right? Yeah, it's coming out in seven days. It's a prequel to the uh, original trilogy, and one of the things I, I always try to say every chance, I, every opportunity I get is that it's a new entry point into the universe. You don't have to have read any other book I've written uh, to enjoy it. And because Mike's a time traveler, and this is posted on January 27th, he of course means today, January 27th, oh, yes, that's you can go right. to stores and buy it, unless you are also a time traveler and watching it live, <laughs> which is right. very confusing. But. And actually, if you judge from Goodreads, I, I think Gemini Cell had something like, you know, eight one-star reviews about six months before it came out, so apparently there were people that were going into the future and, and reading it and weighing in on the topic. So what is the deal with that? Why do you think that kind of thing happens? Are people just immediately biased against a, a certain subject matter, or do they just hate you because you're awful, or what's the deal? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, uh, I, I think what it is is I talked to Mark Lawrence, who's uh, another great fantasy author, uh, who's uh, Broken Empire Trilogy. If, if folks haven't read it, I really recommend it. Uh, he and I have both had this problem for a long time, and it turns out that a lot of Goodreads readers will use the rating system to mark books so that they know to go back for them later. And they don't really think very carefully about the fact that they're giving you one star. And I'm sure some people just sort of don't like the cut of my jib and uh, figure that's the way to, to let me know. Well, Mike, if you don't know, he's a security contractor, government civilian military officer. Uh, his career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare, federal law enforcement. He's done three tours in Iraq, uh, was recalled to serve during, during the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, among many other things, uh, and writes really cool novels that we had a lot of people sign up to give us questions for. <laughs> yeah, and I think also based on that introduction, um, you guys might want to be careful about leaving one-star reviews for Mike Cole because he will find you. Uh, no, no. You know, it's funny you should say this, uh, and, and not to not to make the tone serious, but people always make these jokes about, like, oh, Mike Cole will kick your ass and whatever. And I really, uh, I did a blog post on this. I always feel the need to come out and reassure people I would absolutely never do that. Like, I, I believe so strongly in the professionalization of the use of force and only using it under authorized circumstances. The, thro the thought of uh, brawling is completely anathema to me. I will not come and find you. Come and leave any run-star reviews you want. Say anything critical that you want. Uh, you have nothing to fear from me. Unless, unless they ask you to. Or unless they break the law. <laughs> or break the law. And there's a different story. <laughs> well, that, does, that kind of took the wind out of that joke. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm sorry. <sighs> well, the Mike last Cole time we had Mike on, on this, we this titled the show, Mike Cole Will Kick Your Ass for Free. Oh, yeah. So. We it, are was, it was motivational. It was just, uh, yes, just talking. Exactly. We're, we're perpetuating exactly. a bad, a bad, uh, a bad rumor about Mike Cole, and we need to, we need to get that on lockdown. I think at this, this point. This why, time it'll be Mike Cole will only kick your ass if you really deserve it. <laughs> this is why. This is why nobody ever invites me to parties. <laughs> I bring the mood down. We're gonna just name it. Mike Cole's a really nice guy. Stop talking about him kicking ass. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he kicks ass, but not your ass. That's right. Only bad guys' asses. Absolutely. So uh, you mentioned uh, we were talking a little bit about Gemini Cell, and I know you said that takes place in the Shadow Ops universe. Um, but so this is a completely standalone, or is it better to have gone through other Shadow Ops novels first, or is this something where you can really come in as a first-time reader and and kind of you know pick up right from there? Yeah, come in fresh. Uh, it is chronologically, in terms of story, the earliest book in the series, even though it's my most recent one published. And my craft, I like to think, has developed over time. So if people haven't read me before, this is the book I really want them to come in with. Totally different characters, totally different storyline. Gemini Cell is much more occult than the high magic feeling you've gotten. The, the Shadow Ops trilogy was more like, what would happen if an Apache Longbow gunship went up against a dragon? Um, and Gemini Cell is 
about a U.S. Navy SEAL who gets killed and then is raised from the dead. And in order to raise him from the dead and turn him into this super soldier to, to serve uh, his country, they bind a demon into his own corpse. So he's sharing his, his own superpowered dead body with this corrupting influence and trying to get back to his wife and child who he lost in the process. And I make no bones about it. The, the book is a really bald allegory for PTSD because you have this, um, this guy who's dead and brought back to life. And he's moving, he's reanimated, but he's still dead. And, the, and he can't interact with the world anything like the way he re interacted it, with it before he was killed. And, uh, you know, I know that, that Tolkien, when he was accused of uh, doing Christian allegory, was like, no, 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 yes. Um, but I'm, I'm not making any bones about it. This is, this is absolutely a PTSD book, and I hope that... Um, it, I, I don't think that's something that's been dealt with much in fantasy, except by uh, a couple of authors. I believe I talked about Joe Abercrombie the last time I came on, on the show. Um, and I'm hoping that it, that it starts that conversation and gets that conversation moving in the fantasy community. Well, it's a, it's a great way to get that issue, some awareness in a place where it probably doesn't have as much awareness. That's interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it's definitely something that I, I want to talk about. And one of the wonderful things about fantasy and science fiction is that it lets you sort of go, oh, look over here. I'm not really talking about this, even, mm -hmm. though, it's, even though it's patently obvious. And there's a lot of great fantasy traditions. Some of the authors I grew up with, I mean, Philip Pullman's Dark Materials did this. Uh, C.S. Lewis did that with Narnia. Um, I mean, look, I'm, I'm comparing myself to Giants here. I, I, I should be so lucky to have pulled it off the way they did. But that's, that's definitely what I'm trying to do. Well, you've got a lot of interest in the books. We had a lot of questions, so let's get right to them. Caleb uh, wrote in and said, Last I checked, you were on the sixth draft of your epic fantasy novel, The Fractured Girl. During the process of writing, how many drafts do you usually write before you are completely satisfied? Is, is there a number? Is there a set number? I mean, there isn't a set number. Uh, I try to do less every time, and I'm really hopeful that the sixth draft will be the one that will go to market. Control Point went through, I believe, 19 drafts uh, for... Fortress Frontier went through nine, uh, Breach Zone eight, and Gemini Cell also eight. But the, the, the thing I really want to emphasize here is that done right is always, always, always better than done fast. If I have one weakness as a writer, it's rushing. And in fact, I'm really disappointed at myself that I have to go into a sixth draft because I didn't do it right, and now I have to do it twice. And I'm already trying to break out of this military expectation that um, so many people in publishing have for me. And for that to do that, I have to write a book that absolutely takes the doors off. And I would far rather take a year or two years or five years or however long it takes until that book is fantastic than I would get it out the door and either have a book go to market that's, that's lukewarm or doesn't sell at all. And when you say a draft, is this uh, like starting over or is it polishing? What, how much touch is going on there? In this case, um, I have to throw away probably the first uh, 25 to 40,000 words of the book and, and rewrite all that and then also go through the rest and fix it. I mean... I feel sorry for bringing it up now. <laughs> <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this is what it is. Like, I mean, people, people talk all the time about... Um, do, do you guys ever seen Californication? No. I've seen a couple episodes. I haven't watched it much. Though. David Duchovny. I mean, look, it's it's definitely a risque show, but it's this writer who lives like Keith Richards, right? He lives this life entirely without consequences. And I, when I first became a writer and moved to New York, I had a friend of mine who was like, you know, you need to be like Hank Moody. This is the character in Californication. And I, I turned to him and I said, man, what is the one thing you never see Hank Moody doing? Because he's always going to parties and meeting women. I, you never see him working. You never see him writing. And this is what writing is, right? I mean, I wish I could dash off a first draft and have that first draft be beautiful. But uh, that's not, and I'm, there may be some writers who can do that, but I'm definitely not one of them. That may also be a very boring TV show to watch. <laughs> yes, that would be an extremely boring TV show. David Duchovny writes 16 drafts of his latest novel. <laughs> the still, back of his head bent yeah, over. That's right, he's still typing. Oh, he's going for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, speaking of time management, uh, Douglas has a question. With such a busy schedule fighting crime on the high sea and in cyberspace, how do you set your time for running aside on all your different projects? Uh, I, I That's the thing is I have no regular schedule. My Since my jobs are ops-based, I never know when I'm going to be wind up working 72 hours straight or I'm going to wind up having a lot of free time. And I always say thank God for the miniaturization of the microprocessor because that way I'm able to have equipment with me whenever I travel. I just went out to uh, Confusion, which is a wonderful uh, fan-run fan con out in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and those two hours on the flight there and back were really productive for me. But on commutes, uh, whenever I can grab 10 minutes here and there, and uh, I, I, if I had to write on a set schedule, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. So I'm a very portable and a very mobile writer. That's great. Uh, In fact, the only I was going to say the only short story I ever wrote was on a flight to New York City from San Francisco. So I can, you know, the getting in that zone and being able to focus yeah. on nothing else but writing and not having any Wi-Fi or anything like that uh, does it that, does you wonders. <laughs> that's the key. The key is the internet is shut off. It's yeah. amazing what you can get done with the internet shut off. Uh, Douglas has, a, I think it might be the same. Douglas mm -hmm. has a follow on. Uh, says now that you've gone from digital to traditional books in your apartment, how long will it be before your friends and family worry that you are caught on? Under an avalanche of paper. Oh, you know it's funny. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I want to show you guys something. Let's see. It's a good thing I unplugged the mic. Isn't this cool? See that? Ooh. Oh yeah, I love that. I love, that, I love shows of books. That is crown molding. Like I, I live in a shoebox. My apartment is roughly the size of one of your uh, one of your like dining room tables, and uh, and for that, you know, I, I get to pay the GDP of a small country because I live in Brooklyn. Um, so you got to be really creative about using vertical space. So I like, and of course, you know, true hipster, uh, I got like hundred-year-old clabbered, you know, reclaimed barn beams that they went, they went upstate and got. I have no way of verifying this. They probably like just, you know, painted something and charged me a million dollars for it. Um, but yeah, I ripped, I ripped out the crown molding, and my crown molding, for those of you who aren't watching this, all around my apartment is a single row of books, and it's awesome because you can store a lot of books, and uh, I just love. You know, I love the sort of nerd uh, nerd uh, vibe that it gives to the whole apartment. Um, How do you reach them, though? They're very high. Um, well, do you have you know, a rolly ladder? Oh, you know? do that. Like, like Lex Luthor in the first yeah. movie? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I right now I'm using a crappy step ladder, but uh, yeah, I think that does call. This calls for a rolly ladder. I think. <laughs> Great idea. Absolutely. Nice. And then we have another question from Wes, who I don't know why, I feel like it's probably Wes Chu. Um, he says, uh, how do you keep from giving in to all those urges to have fun? Winky face. <laughs> that's that's got to be Wes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, fun, look, uh, you know, he, he asked, he's asking a funny question. I'll answer it seriously to help uh, depress the mood. Uh, um, I, this is the thing, is that I really feel like if the that comfort is sort of the enemy of of achievement. I always say, uh, you know, there's the old sentence, "Are you sitting comfortably before you read someone a story?" I always say, "Are you sitting comfortably?" Well, that may be your problem right there. Um, I just feel like crucibles are where iron is made, um, and every time I've achieved something in my life that's really meant something to me and that I really really value and treasure, it's it's been because I was in a crucible. Um, and that's everything from heading over to Iraq to responding to domestic disasters here to to actually finally getting over the hump with writing and, and get securing a book deal. I was just miserable in all of those areas. And I think I'm not advocating being a miserable person, but I do think that, you know, misery is a thing that can be harnessed and uh, effectively used to to be to to, cr to produce stuff. And uh, I don't know, there may be people who can be uh, Fun and uh, and jolly and and able to get stuff done at the same point. I, I kind of need to be. Uh, it has to be too cold in the room for me. I think. Mm. Which leads us right to Eric's question: Do you like unicorns? <laughs> Why do you not have unicorns in your books? Will you be putting unicorns in any future books? Ah uh -huh. I call shenanigans. I do have a unicorn in. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Um. It is a, a dead unicorn. It's being dissected. Oh, oh, being dissected. Crap being dissected in a military research facility, um, but there is a unicorn. So uh, I, I challenge that statement. So suck on go, that, Eric. Eric. <laughs> Eric's probably following up right now in his mind with, but what about any live unicorn? <laughs> what about live unicorns? Well, they're, 
They're harder to study. They're harder for the U.S. Army to study. Yeah. Now, I know that you are famous for your D&D games. I think pretty much every author we've we've had on this show at this point has either been in a D&D game with you or been a dungeon master or you are the dungeon master. I forget which one of you guys typically is the dungeon master. But um, Andy wants to know, how do you as a dungeon master adapt after the players roll an epic round of critical failures? Yeah. <laughs> do you take pity on them or murder them with glee? So this is, uh, first of all, a credit where credit is due. It, uh, the author D&D game at Confusion is the brainchild and, uh, and intellectual property of uh, Peter V. Brett, uh, the author of the awesome Demon Cycle series and my best friend since our uh, senior year in high school. And, uh, and he's been on the show before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, just to just set the record straight on that, I usually DM. I did get to play the year that we did Queen of the Demon Web Pits, but our last game where we did uh, B1 in Search of the Unknown, which is the first D and D module ever, which came out with uh, the basic set. Uh, and the thing that was so funny about it is, when you're a nerdy kid growing up in Wisconsin uh, and making a D&D module, you make these elaborate mazes and you think they're really, really cool. But then when those of us in 2014 play it, it, it I mean, it's not so cool anymore. It's like, oh, there's another corridor looping back on itself and back on itself. So I really had to do some, some dancing. But what Eric is bringing up is that we had a roll of six fumbles in a roll. So basically the, uh, the players were stabbing each other while the monsters stood around and laughed at them. And uh, I was tempted to take it easy on them, but the comic value, it was, this is real comedy gold here, and I just couldn't let it pass. So I'm afraid that uh, by the end of the module, uh, the thief had been killed by another player's stab, and the magic user had been accidentally stabbed with a poison dagger and had died from the poison on it. That's how we actually closed out the game. Hard luck, yeah. yeah. You're a tough but one, huh? It was really funny. <laughs> Who rolls six ones in a row? It was amazing. The answer is murder them with glee. This, is, was, a, yeah. this is why you play D&D. &D. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Robert uh, caught the last time you were on Sword and Laser. He said uh, you recommended John Henry Jack Campbell as one of the best authors of military sci-fi, uh, and Robert wanted to thank you for that. He found it, read it, really enjoyed the Paul Sinclair books. He says, given the popularity of so many SEAL Team X type novels in the action genre, are there any authors you've read in that space who authentically capture the military experience? And are there any you'd recommend? Uh, specifically for uh, stories about SEAL operators? Um, I think he's talking about the action genre in general, but he's referencing oh. that there's so many of that type out there. Sure. Um, I mean, for uh, I'm going to stick to science fiction and fantasy, of course. Um, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I really enjoyed the film Lone Survivor uh, about, uh, about the, the SEAL team that was involved in Operation Red Wings. The lieutenant in charge of that mission, Mike Murphy, is a local guy from here in New York, um, and he's actually buried out here instead of in Arlington. Uh, the book didn't do much for me, but I really, really think the movie is worth your time. For science, military science fiction, um, Robert Buechner's Jason Wander series is really, really good. Uh, and Robert Buechner, like Jack Campbell, is a former military intelligence officer, and his knowledge of the the ins and outs and the the politics and bureaucracy of the military really really sounds authentically. The first book in that series is called Orphanage, and it's really really uh, really really worth your time. Nice. And then also there kind of are. related to this one, uh, Dara wants to know: Do you have any sci-fi fantasy books that you really liked that people might not expect from a military sci-fi writer? For instance, do you secretly curl up with the Parasol Protectorate by Gail Carriger or <laughs> Shades of Milk and Honey by Mary Robin and Kowal? And what would you like to see more of in the SSF? I can never say SFF. I always F want to truncate it to SFF because people write it that way. It's very hard for me to say. Then say F and SF and give fantasy its its, uh -huh. its rightful place. F and SF. F and SF. <laughs> what would you like to see more of in the F and SF genres? Any tropes that you're sick of? So uh, do you secretly curl up with uh with uh, uh you know something like Parasol Protectorate, and uh, what genres? Uh, wait, no tropes. What tropes are you sick of? Um, I I uh, I will. I will I will answer that question. Uh, I, I love Gail Carriger and I love Mary Robinette Kowal, uh, and I've just seen both of them recently. And I also Sherry Priest is. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to her, uh, who I saw at Confusion. But really, what I'm I'm I love, and I've said this before, is romance. And I think I've told you guys before that I got really really upset 
when I was told uh, a couple years back that men couldn't write category romances. We could write single title romances like Nicholas Sparks does, but not category romances, what are pejoratively and wrongly called bodice rippers. And that really pissed me off because science fiction and fantasy, people used to say that women couldn't write that, which is why the pen name Robin Hobb was developed or Andre Norton. And that was just wrong. And it's also just wrong that men can't write and appreciate category romance. The fact is that 50% of all heterosexual relationships and 100% of uh, same-sex male homosexual relationships involve a guy. So we, we do fall in love. We do have sex. We do get married. We are interested in those things. And so I got really like, I'm going to write a romance. And the end result of that is that I haven't written a romance, right? But I did do a lot of reading. Um, and I read, um, I read Nora Roberts. I read Diana Gabaldon. I also read Nick Sparks. I read Nalini Singh. I read Laura Lee. Um, Laura Lee's really like a, a, a super sexual, um, like, she's super filthy, super dirty. And uh, I also read a Wear Hedgehog erotica for Pat Rothfuss's World Builders charity and wrote a review of it. Ooh, oh, wait, wait. So what? A Wear Hedgehog erotica? I'm not say? kidding. A Wear Hedgehog erotica. The main. This the, is right up my alley. So. Uh, it's called Hedging His Bets. And if you. Of course it is! <laughs> you could... Of course it is! If you Google it and you and you Google my name with it or World Builders, you'll find my video review and you can you can learn everything you wanted to know. But I really look. This is the thing: is I Dan Savage has this attitude of GGG, good giving and game. For those of you who don't know, Dan Savage is the guy who does the Savage Love Advice column, which I just adore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was not going to prejudge this Wear Hedgehog erotica. If the writers took it seriously, I was going to take it seriously. And um, Coming to it with that attitude was incredibly, uh, it, it made, look, I, I still, the book didn't tar entirely work for me, but I still got a lot more out of it than I would have if I had come to it with, wear a hedgehog erotica, that's ridiculous. And, uh, and I just felt like a, maybe I'm flattering myself, but like a better person for not, I mean, no one is being hurt by someone else being sexually charged by the idea of a guy who turns into a hedgehog. So um, the thing is, Reading romance and taking romance seriously, especially category romance, allowed me to experience some really, really cool stories that I would have missed another otherwise. And I really would like to see more of that in all genres. I think that all great stories are about people. They're really about characters. And I think that particularly when we're writing high-octane action books like I do, fantasy tends to be really sword fight heavy and really violent. We tend to get kind of squicked out and uncomfortable about it. Um, if, if you look at the old Robert E. Howard books like Conan and, and Gore, they're full of sex, but the sex all takes place off camera. Um, and uh, I really would love to see more of that romance uh, along the lines of what we know is a category of romance to be filtered into other genres because I know it, it's really wonderful when it's done right. Now, the other part of this question from Dara was, are there any tropes that you're sick of that you're like, eh, let's give that one a rest for a couple decades? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, wow. I mean, stuff that I think uh, people have, have already, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really tired of hooded fi figures on the books of covers. I'm not interested in reading about assassins anymore. Um, in my own genre, the military genre, and it's something I've really stri striven hard against, is that I, I, I'm really done with military figures that are super confident and super locked on and, and always have sober judgment and always make great decisions. I want to see really flawed characters that that flail all over the place because that's what normal human beings do and that's what normal human beings in the military do too. Well, there's a fine tradition of that evolution of characters in fantasy itself, right? We used to have like perfect heroes and infallible wizards. And over time, we found that it was more interesting to make the wizard not be good all the time, make the hero have a flaw, you know? So that makes perfect sense to me. I always say that that Frodo's greatest character flaw was excessive earnestness. I, I mean, I love Tolkien and I love Frodo to death because it's my roots, but I have zero in common with that hobbit. Like, I mean, I feel like he would look down his nose at me because of all the mistakes I make or, you know, because I'm a human being. Yeah, we're all Samwise. We're none of us Frodo. Bill, Bill would right. never judge you. That's Bill, right. Yeah. He would never judge. That's right. <laughs> and, for, and by the way, and by the way, what happens to Frodo? He's like Galahad or Percival. He's literally he goes off into the Grey Havens. Uh, oops, I just spoiled. Sorry. Just oh, spoiled. yeah. Spoiler alert there, really. Sorry. I'm a bad uh, well, maybe they don't know what that is if they haven't actually read the book, but who hasn't read the 
book or seen the movie. Yeah, you know what? If you if you haven't read it, you're fired. Get out. Statute of limitations <laughs> on that on spoilers for Seriously. for Lord yeah. of the Rings or The Hobbit is done. Long yes. gone. Yes. Long now gone. I don't know what the genesis of this question is, but Robert asked the question: What was it like basically running into one of the protagonists from Gemini Cell in real life? Oh. <laughs> I know what that is. I know what that is. Um, I uh, I've I've met somebody recently who, and I'm really you know excited about the relationship. And um, she's the impetus of these bookshelves that you see all around you. Uh, and uh, she's when uh, the 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 protagonist's wife, Sarah Schweitzer, uh, who is sort of like one of the main characters in the book, and was actually a real challenge for me to write because I've really, really tried to push the envelope and write more in the point of view of people who are not like me. And Sarah is A, a woman, and B, uh, a very, very successful artist. And I write, uh, writing her POV was really pushing my envelope and something that I um, I really got a lot out of. But uh, I'm not sure if it was Robert, but I a few people have remarked that um, Sarah Schweitzer looks exactly like my girlfriend. And I wrote her... Uh, long before I met her, so it was clear that that was at least a uh, a physical uh, look that appealed to me. So I think that that's a little dig, uh, mm. a little dig at me in that direction. What was it like? It was fantastic. <laughs> you, got, you have a type, is what he's saying. Uh, well, I mean, I don't. I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, now I do. Sure. <laughs> or maybe you just got so like enamored with the character, you found yourself looking for that in the external world. Yes, yes. Well, you know, there's it's funny. a novel in there about the author who had the power to turn characters into real people that would show up in his life. I mean, I, I, I feel, I feel, I, I felt kind of creepy when I wrote the character of Scylla, who is sort of the. She's not quite the protagonist of Breach Zone. She's the antagonist, but she gets a lot of screen time. And as I crafted her character, I felt very close to her. And what was so strange about it was, is, is in a lot of ways there are elements of her personality, which is kind of scary because she's an antagonist, um, that I was sort of my ultimate, my, my dream date. And uh, I was so fortunate that on the cover of the British edition, they, they actually did a photograph. And they, um, they got a model and they cut her hair like Scylla and they put her on the cover. And I can't tell you how cool it is to live with a character in your mind. And, and dream them up and then see a picture of that character like a real picture not a painting that's that's who that's her she's almost as if she were alive and right now I'm listening to the graphic audio audio drama of my book so now I'm hearing my characters voices like not someone reading the book but my characters voices I, I can't describe to you what it's like I, I, if there's a more fe affirming feeling in the world I think it's pretty hard to find well, so what would have happened? I mean, I know this has happened to authors we've we've talked to in the past, where they get the the book art back, and and it's someone who does not look at all like they ever imagined their character to look like. So, are, do you feel lucky? Do you feel fortunate? Or? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is well, my my experience is very unusual because it was funny when when I first had got my cover inputs, meaning that the author gets to tell the publisher what they want. Uh, a, a number of authors who were more veteran than me pulled me aside because I was sort of, you know, exploding all over the internet. Oh my god, I'm going to give inputs for my cover. And they pulled me aside and like, come here, kid, let me talk to you. You're gonna you're gonna give your publisher inputs and then they're gonna completely ignore them and you're not gonna you're not gonna you're gonna get a pink lion or something, you know, something crazy like that. Um, but because the publisher really wanted to get the military gear right and because I, 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 and I'm, I may be flattering myself here, so if I'm, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. I believe I was the only person writing in fantasy who was currently serving in the military. Mm -hmm. I really was brought in as, an, as, a, as, a, as a subject matter expert for that. And once I had weaseled in the door, uh, I guess through a combination of that and, and obsequiousness, and, and you know, I was able to I sort of act as my own art director. Um, I really have an unprecedented level of input into my covers, both in the U.S. and Britain. And while there are certain things that where the publisher is just like, no, dude, you're, you're wrong, we're not doing that. I, I mean, like, I, I, I almost, you know, I basically was like, this is what her hair looks like. This is the actress she most closely resembles. This is her fitness level. This is the clothing she's wearing. Like, everything on that cover I really had a lot of input into. 
That's awesome. That's, that's really that fun. is very fortunate. I think I, I don't think a lot Definitely. of people have that opportunity, so that's really cool. Um, our final question from the audience comes from Michelle, who says, "Have you read Glenn Cook's Black Company books? And if so, what did you think of his military life portrayal? And if not, get on that, sir." <laughs> yes, understood. Um, the the first one, and uh, the the problem with I mean, he, he, he's great. I mean, and obviously he's a legend and and one of the giants on whose shoulders I stand. Uh, but Glenn Cook is doing the medieval army, and I'm doing a modern one. And um, the there's a real gulf between those. And uh, I'll give you an ex and I'll give you just one tiny example of this. Uh, is that medieval military um, virtue is individual. Um, the idea that you ride forth with your own personal coat of arms and you are out in front. Of the of the people you lead, and uh, you shout your lineage, and then engage. You know, this is what jousting comes from. This is what sword duels come from. The idea of individual heroism carrying the day. Modern militaries have completely dispensed with this idea in favor of a cold professionalism, where the individual is dispensed with. Um, in favor of the fighting prowess of a unit, where where identity is erased. And people function as an interlocking machine made of hundreds of parts. And it is a, it has been proven time and time again. And the best example of this in 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 cinema uh, is I mean it's a dramatic representation. And unfortunately, it's a it's not a great movie, but it's The Last Samurai, which the Tom Cruise film, which shows a, a feudal army uh, of a, of the old Tokugawa style coming up against the the Meiji modern army that has copied European fighting tradition. And obviously, the result is. It's just flat out massacre. So uh, Glenn Cook's, of course, great writer, but we're we really are working in two different mediums. Do you feel more closely? Res uh, I mean, if you had a conversation about this with like Brian McClellan, for example, in Powder Mage trilogy, is that like kind of where does that fall uh, in the in the spectrum? Much clo much closer. But if I, uh, it's funny. Uh, a lot of people don't guess this, but if I was to compare myself to one writer in terms of the military, it's Naomi Novik. Naomi Novik is a yeah, real, temporary series. Yeah, she is a real Napoleonic scholar, and she gets in in her crafting of Lawrence's uh, fastidiousness and his commitment to honor, but his his sort of bureaucratic administrative capability, like that, to me feels so much closer uh, to what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I mean, it's and if people haven't read the Temeraire series, the first book is His Majesty's Dragon, and it is really one of the great military works. And it infuriates me, infuriates me that people don't call it them military novels. They are profoundly and fundamentally military stories, as much as mine, if not more so. That's Do you think awesome. part of the reason you identify is because that era is sort of at the transition into the modern army, and so there's a more overlap? Yeah, and, and because the dragons are forcing this tremendous social change, uh, and that that is forcing the officer corps in the British army to confront itself. For example, long-winged dragons, which spit acid, I believe, and they're one of the most effective, uh, basically, close air support mechanisms that the British army has, will only accept female captains. So now you have Victorian society suddenly to have to grant extensive military authority to women. And what does it do? And the parallels uh, between that and the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the modern military uh, are, are so – it's such an incredibly relevant and intelligent way to tackle it. And she does it with such amazing sensitivity and authenticity. Marion Zimmer Bradley famously said, if you want to make a political point, uh, rent out a hall and pass out leaflets. It's more honest. Um, and Novik does not run afoul of that uh, admonition at all. It's just such great writing, and I am so incredibly, frankly, jealous of it at times. No, I love I love that entire series, and and that's a really interesting perspective. I don't think I ever would have thought about um, without your your kind of expertise in there. So thank thank you for that. That that was. Yep. Really fascinating. We're always um, happy to talk about Naomi Novik. <laughs> I know she's the best. Oh, I love that series yeah, so much. Great. We read His Majesty's Dragon um, for the book club, didn't we? Or was that a, nope. a secondary? I think that was. Um, we read A Natural History of Dragons, and Temeraire might have been the alt pick for that yeah, because I think yeah, I think so many it. people had had read it already because it's so. Well, popular. We interviewed Naomi at DragonCon last year. We did, and she was. Absolutely wonderful. Just a, just an absolute joy to have on the show. Um, but Mike, thank you so much for coming back on the show. So the book is out. Yeah, it's out. It's out. Uh, I, 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 and it's selling very well. If it's January 27th, <laughs> that book is out. <laughs> Wait, what is the date? 
wait, <laughs> where, where am I in the month? It is not. Is it, we're, it's still Monica, January, right? We're recording it a week before we post it. <laughs> So we're pretending like it's out. So when I was when I was full time, uh, when I was writing full time before I went back to work with the police department, I was hanging out in Prospect Park with Pete Brett, and uh, we were flying a kite with his daughter, and uh, we were we had the same kind of thing. And and finally, I turned to him, and he looks at me, and he goes, "You've forgotten what day it is. You are finally a day person. You are finally not an office guy." So I can tell him in the presence of artists. This is my life. I have not been in an office, and however, I actually I thought today was Sunday for like a few hours today <laughs> and it was really confusing to me why Ryan my husband was not at home I was like where is he <laughs> he's been on for hours I don't know if you guys know the Graham Norton show it's a BBC talk show they show it on BBC America here and they have Harvey Weinstein on this week's show and there's a clip I saw where Harvey Weinstein says uh, where, where Graham says like so so uh, the trailer came out yesterday and he's like no it came out this morning and then Graham goes no it came out yesterday. <laughs> They're taping it a day at a time. <laughs> that is me right now. I am. I am. Grimmel. You're Harvey Hi. Weinstein. I'm Harvey Weinstein. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much. Congratulations on the on the success of the book. It is is blowing up today on release day here. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, who knows? I'm in this weird Schrodinger's universe where I'm both a New York Times bestseller and not a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> you won't know until you open the New York Times. That's right. Conferences. That's right. And where can everyone follow your work online? All right, so you can come to my website at www.mikecole.com, and that's M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Mike Cole, spelled the same way, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Mike Cole. And you can tell I have said that before. <laughs> and of course if you guys want to continue to support Sword and Laser head over to patreon.com slash sword and laser and of course you can also support the show by buying books through our links you can find upcoming and past new releases at swordandlaser.com slash calendar of course you can always reach us at feedback at swordandlaser.com head over to swordandlaser.com or goodreads.com slash swordandlaser man I just threw a lot of links at you guys I hope, <laughs> I hope you are writing these down and finally if you want to call and leave a voicemail we'll play it on the show for you the phone number is 4157SWORD6. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.